Stop Everywhere, your podcast all about Doctor Who, and we have a fun one to talk about today. Yes, we do. Uh, not a lot of guest stars. Uh, I am Jesse Jackson, and joining me at the console is Charles Skaggs. Hey, Charles. Hello, everybody. How's that? How's things uh, out there in time and space? Uh, yeah, it is um, a little wet and damp here in Texas. But uh, it was a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. How are things up in Ohio? Uh, a little bit drier than uh, yes. than you, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, not bad, not bad. Uh, the sun came out today after a couple of days in dark, gloomy, blah, late November weather. But, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, the sun was out today, so I got out for a little bit, snuck down to a little... Uh, mini comic book convention just to oh, do nice. just to do a little shopping for a couple hours no big deal okay so, and nothing did you nothing. find anything fun uh yeah i picked up some old marvel star wars from the original run from the, Ooh, the nice. 70s so yeah the, i've mm-hmm. been trying to like i originally had those issues back in the day but sadly they were lost in a flood in a basement okay. much to my childhood trauma but so I've been like, I was in with all the new Star Wars hype. I was like, well, let me go around and, and pick those issues up again. So I've been tracking them down here and there. Yeah, I've read all the alias books. Yes. But I don't have them handy, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't file my stuff the way that Charles does. And Charles does a great job of keeping all this stuff organized. So I was looking to pick up... Um, inexpensive copies of the trade paperbacks to kind of reread yeah, as sure. I'm going through Jessica Jones. Um, I recommend you know. tales of wonder.com. You can get those for like 42, 44% off. All right. We'll have to check that out. That's and they good. just, they're back in print. So yeah, that's, yeah. that was a good time to get them. Very good. And the show is right. great by the way. Oh yes. Um, yeah. I've gone through two episodes and uh, I've enjoying discussing it on this uh, fine network. Um, and we had a T-shirt sale over uh, Black Friday. Yes, we do. So we're hoping. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, uh, shame on you for not following the Facebook page for not knowing yes. and Twitter. Uh, we now have official Next Stop Everywhere T-shirt. Woot! Uh, yes. On, on T Public. Yes. And uh, if you would, uh, we have links on our Twitter page and our also on our Facebook page. So if you go to those links, those should take you directly to the uh, T-shirt if you're so inclined. If you want to look cool as you travel through time and space uh, with the official Next Stop Everywhere T-shirt, highly recommend it. And uh, also, if you if you go to those either those Facebook or Twitter links, then uh, then you know uh, that helps support the show. Yes. So yeah. So all of you out there, all you Nexties. We'd love for you to to help us out and help help us build up this show a little. Absolutely. Um, and look cool doing it. Absolutely. Uh, I've ordered mine. I've ordered mine as well, and I ordered one yes. for Lori. So. Oh, nice. So. Uh, I ordered that, and then I ordered a set lusting Bruce, of course. Um, so let's talk Heaven Sent. Yes. Uh, quick thoughts, Charles. Uh, well, obviously this is... Well, it's supposed to be part one of a two-part finale, but really it's part two of a three-part finale. I agree. Following up after uh, last week, um, but, uh, you know, after Face the Raven. But um, this this is essentially, the Doctor is now without Clara. He's by himself. He's trapped in some sort of prison. And has to figure his way out of it. And it essentially, this is a brilliant, brilliant showcase for Peter Capaldi. 
um, who knocks it out of the park, in my opinion, in this episode. He, okay. um, he is terrific. Uh, this is probably his seminal episode. Uh, it's just, just perfect. Uh, the mystery uh, is, it's written by Stephen Moffat, so naturally it's convoluted, but this time it actually works out for the most part. And uh, there's a nice little payoff for Doctor Who fans right at the end. So leading us into the uh, Series 9 finale. Uh, yeah, I um, I think I liked the episode. <laughs> um, I watched it last night. Uh, we had some friends over. Mm-hmm. And um, so after you know they left and uh, Linda went to bed, I kind of watched the episode and enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, but was kind of frustrated that I, I doesn't. I kept wanting to know who's setting this kind of trap and what's going on. We don't know yet. That's part of the mystery. Yeah, and so I watched it again today. Right. Seeing if I'd like it a little bit better because I knew there wasn't going to get a payoff. Yeah. Right. Um, and. I think I liked it, but um, I'm 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 just not sure. Okay. Um. So we get uh, the doctor shows up in this teleport teleportation tube, right? Right. And he gives a nice little talk about if you're, you know, if you're the person that hurt Clara, yeah, you know, this is not going to be a good day for you, and all this. He presumes he's being watched, so yeah, he's calling out whoever's imprisoned him here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what do you think of the veil um, kind of creature that's slowly coming to get him? Um, I thought it was really cool. Uh, the actor, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's essentially the same actor that played Colony Sarf at the beginning of the season. Okay. Um, and Jamie Reed Quarrel, according to IMDb. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but I thought he was he was fantastic. He, um, I mean, he doesn't get any dialogue. He's just basically there to kind of limp along. And uh, I'm not sure why the the veil is limping, but okay, just to give him that little make him a little more creepier, I guess. But uh, he's essentially this unstoppable threat that the Doctor has to kind of avoid as he's figuring out this mystery and uh, has to go and obviously he goes through these motions over what at least inside, uh, inside uh, this prison is a very long period, very, very, very long period of time. But uh, whether that actually is the time that actually took place outside is another story. Um, yeah, this is very much a, um, you know, one of those, you know, it's it's a Doctor Who version of Groundhog Day, of um, the uh, Ty Diggs uh, TV show that was on, um, you know, where they, I can't remember the na- name right now, and I'm looking up, but anyway, this premise of your you keep reliving everything, right, and. Um, my first, why didn't the wall of the stuff that's, you know, harder than diamonds, why didn't it reset every time? Yeah. The, um, asbantium or whatever it's called. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it was basically that wall was outside. At least that's, that's the impression I got that it was outside the uh, area that reset. Okay. Because this was a trap that the doctor is essentially what I took from this episode. Yes. Is that this was a, a very, basically a torture trap for the doctor. Yeah. Um, in order to solve this mystery, he has to go through suffering again and again and again and again in order to formulate his escape. And there only, and there only appears to be one way out. And so, so so it's my, my, my belief that 
Yeah. This whole thing, I mean, this was just a deliberate setup to torture the doctor. Do you feel that um, all but, the skulls in the water were him when he's unsuccessful? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's 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 okay. the way they implied it. That um, um, I'm presuming everybody's seen the episode, or if you haven't, you're kind of listening yep. to the wrong podcast at the moment. Yes, you are. Because we're going to spoil the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every time he goes up to those ramparts, um, he sets his predecessor's skull up there. And yeah. and it goes into the sea. And so, yeah, all those skulls down there are just, I mean, there's millions of, of doctor skulls in there. Yes. As a, these, these copies of the doctor that keep getting created mm-hmm. um, from this teleporter. Now, how this teleporter doesn't break down after billions of years, I have no idea. Just uh, It just keeps churning out copy after copy after copy after copy after copy. But uh, because that original template is still in there. So we have a boot a bootstrap situation, right? Sort of. Where did yeah, the clothes we, come from? Where yeah, did the clothes come from? Where did the clothes from? come from originally? Yes. That first time. Yeah. Um, because Unless there were clothes left, because this whole thing has been constructed. Right. So it's possible that maybe there were the doctor's clothes were left for him. Yeah. By whoever constructed this trap within the confession dial. And do you think there are times when the doctor uh, dies without a plan? In other words, he has not figured out the um, plan yet. Like, you know, we see 7,000 years into this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Was that the first time when we see him, you know, get to room 12 and and get to do the, you know, he determines what he needs to do. Do you think there were other times when he went ahead and died? Um, no, the, um, I don't, I don't know exactly at what point the plan gets formulated. Okay. Because, um, he goes through all these motion or, you know, these motions and has to figure things out and kind of, like figure out the mystery every yeah. single time. Right. So yeah. it's just, it just so happens that the only thing that really changes is that, that hole in the Asbantium mm-hmm. wall, uh, yeah. keeps going in farther and farther and farther. So maybe he figures like as he, after he gets to a certain point inside that, well, you know, somebody must be, and it, it must be me. Mm-hmm. Um, pummeling my way through. Why do you um, – so do you – does the does the doctor have to give a fresh confession each time to Vail, or does Vail reset, and so he gives the same confessions or versions of the same confession every time? I think it's – I think okay. it's the exact same thing. I think it's like Groundhog okay. Day that okay. that that the veil and the doctor are going through those motions over and over and over again. Okay. There's nothing new, and until the point where the doctor decides, well, that's it. Uh, I'm just about through. Yeah. That wall. So guess what? No more confessions. Do you feel, Charles, that? that this was a test that someone was putting in place of him? Did you think they wanted him to escape? I think or, that... Uh, go ahead. Because if not, why did they leave an escape path? Which is hard to get through, right? but it was an escape path. I think, it, like I said, I think it was just a, t- uh, a way to torture the doctor without killing him. Okay. I think it's somebody that is trying to manipulate the doctor into a specific place. Okay. But wants him to go through complete hell, literally, mm-hmm. uh, to get there. So, Charles, your theory is that they want him to go through all the different mazes. Su- suffering over Corridors, over. going through all this thing, and then finally finding room 12, mm-hmm. and then you can't do anything. Right. And... 
Well, but do you think they're going to figure out that he's going to go through this over and over again? Or do you think they assumed he would stay alive and just keep, you know, counting and staying ahead of the beast? That's that's the question. And I don't think we know the answer yet. OK, um, we may not get the answer, but hopefully we do. But see, and I, I, I see, I have to think, though, that that um, whoever was smart enough to construct this trap for the doctor knows the doctor well enough to figure well he's going to figure a way out it may mm-hmm. not be what i expect yeah but he's going to figure a way out see and i think that's part of the reason why i'm not as a f- big as a fan of this episode for that very reason you know like time heist mm-hmm. had it it played with this, but it gave us enough clear answers. And this one, um, it feels to me a little bit like, let me show you how clever I can be mm-hmm. in writing a story. And I just don't know if... Um, well, we don't know. I mean, this is only part two of the three. So I, is it, I don't think it's fair to say, well, we're going to answer everything in, in part two. Absolutely. However, there is a track record of not necessarily answering things. I understand that. Now you, I, re- and, I get that. And I also think that... You're justified to be skeptical. Sometimes, does the episode work on its own way? You know, and I'm on the record, take a drink. You know, I'm not as much fan of, um, you know, two or three parters as some. And I... Cliffhangers are awesome. Yeah. So, and, you know, this was not a true cliffhanger. I also. Um, oh, I think there was a big cliffhanger at the end. Of I this. did not know <laughs> that was necessary a Gallifreyan city when I saw it. You did not recognize the exact same thing from Last of the Time Lords and all the other times we've seen the, the uh, capital? No, I did not. It's with the globe and everything? Did not. You need to go back and watch some old, well, doc- some or, old, or perhaps you know you can blame your that's, audience. That's but t- that's tenant era. You should you should be all over that. I'm just saying it did not make it. It's um, it's perfectly identifiable. Okay, I'm just telling you. For me, it did not make that right away to me. Go on Twitter and see the reactions. Of everybody going ah, oh, it's, no, it's I, Gallifrey. I, ah. Oh, I I understand. After the fact, I went. Oh, it's Gallifrey. Oh, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But then that asked all the other questions. I thought Gallifrey was uh, was lost, and I thought that it's in this pocket universe. And well, ha- maybe that's where sure. we are. Yeah. So how did this do this? So um, we don't know I, yet. Yeah, um, so it was a very unsatisfying story for me. Okay. Uh, I won't say it's bad, and I do think, um, I think Peter Capaldi has already earned his, um, you know, skins on the wall as a doctor. Right. And I don't think we necessarily needed an episode of him being alone and talking to himself. Um, so that did not impress me as much as it seemed to impress you. Well, really, he's talking to us, the audience. Right. Because and he makes the comment that, like, um, I love to have an audience when he's looking kind of dra- breaking the fourth yeah. wall a little bit mm-hmm. and, and looking at us. So he's he's, you know, he's he's kind of stepping outside his own character and, and saying, well, yeah, I, I, since I don't have Clara with me, even even though I'm I'm relying on her as I go into my little um my storm room mm-hmm. you know, my, my mind palace like to borrow a phrase from Sherlock yeah. um that you know he's we're essentially his companion he's talking to us because he has no other companion in this episode did you um I did like the idea of the doctor always determines he's going to win mm-hmm. is the first rule right. and then figuring out and how he slows things down and mentally pictures himself in the TARDIS so he can figure things are out. Right. Um, like seeing the chalkboard again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a nice moment, but it, I also had a problem Charles with the doctor being, afraid 
Okay. You know, when this creature was getting close. Doctor's not allowed to get afraid. Be afraid. It just seems like that's an awful small thing to be afraid of. You know? Because then later, oh, and I'm in, I'm in a personalized death box. Mm-hmm. It must be Christmas. You know, right, where... Right. So, uh, a little bit, just a little bit of... Um, you know, because they do make references sometimes. You know, I'm. I don't know what's going on, and oh, I haven't had that feeling before. So, mm-hmm. it, it, maybe if he had played it a little more humorful, I yeah. might have liked it a little more. It just seemed a little out of character and unlike the Doctor. Well, remember, he's also at this point he's he's still coping with uh, Clara's death. He just he just watched Clara die. Okay, he's, he's not exactly in the jokey mood. All right, and he's obviously so, still bothered by it because he's he's picturing Claire in his head, trying to talk get him through this. Yes. So Charles, should he call her his best friend? I mean, how many his, his companions best, does he has? Well, it's the same. How many times? I mean, he used to call. You know, he used to call Amy that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it just seems that. Well, remember my current best friend. <laughs> well, as as Missy phrased it so eloquently, Clara is the puppy. Yes. So, if you've had more than one pet over yeah. the years, okay, that pet at that time is your best friend. Okay, I can buy that. You you may you know like say for example you have a dog. And that dog is your best friend, but sadly, after time, maybe the dog dies, probably. So um, then you get another dog. Now, you don't stop loving the dog that you had, but you love the dog that you have now. That dog now is now your your new best friend. And so you would say, you know, I just lost my best friend. Right. It would be not my current best friend. Okay, I'll buy that. That's that's one nitpick. Because you, you have to kind of picture I've... like the doctor, because the doctor lives for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. So it's it's essentially like okay, I've got a pet that doesn't live very long. Yes. Or doesn't stay very long. Right. So I. Right. So, but at that time when the the pet is here, mm-hmm. I'm putting 100 percent into that pet. Fair enough. Do you feel um did you know the grim fairy tale story he was talking about? I did not, but again, this is Stephen Moffat. He obviously mm-hmm. loves fairy tales. Yes, that has and been a consistent that's it's thought. something we've talked about. Um and here this is no secret here that the, basically this is his version of this fairy tale with you know the he Moffat framed the story around the concept of the bird over time wearing down an entire mountain with its beak. So essentially that's what this story is. It's a, it's, it's a version of that, that fairy tale. And I will tell you one of the things I liked a lot was the, um, the idea that he scratched bird, you know, in the dirt to remind himself, to remind himself because he would know that story. Now, why did he is did he put the clue that says you need to get to room twelve? He buried so that it would not be reset. Well, no, that gets reset because it was within the confines. It was inside the castle. So why did he have to bury that clue? He didn't bury that clue. The, Who the, did? Well, they, whoever designed this trap, it reset basically. So, like, um, you know, you ever play a video game where you get farther along and you know you end up dying? Yeah. So you end up going back to the original saved setting. Right. And, 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 the galaxy, and, and so yeah, exactly, the yes, exactly. Yes, so you have I to go through all times. those steps all over again. Yeah, that's and the, that's what this felt like. And, and that's I, what and that's what this is. So basically, everything gets. Reset back to the default setting, you know, like he has to, you know, dig everything out again, you know, and, and so it's basically he has to go through all these emotions, including the digging. The only th- the only thing that 
is different is that increasing hole in the asbantium wall. Everything else gets reset back to zero. Yeah, and I've already shared my nitpick of that, so I'm going to let that go. Okay. Um, so this kind of, once again, feeds the theory that whoever designed this put an escape valve in place. Exactly. They, 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 uh, they, my theory is that, yeah, they wanted to torture the doctor, but leave him that out. Yes. Because and then if you could have... And that's why the shovels are there a couple of times, mm-hmm. and there's that you know soft dirt. And once you open it, you see the idea, you know, the clue that says "find," you know, room number twelve. Right now, if you think about it, if if this trap was designed to kill the doctor, why not mm-hmm. have like thousands of veils roaming yeah. the halls? And then, you know, not leave that doctor the ability to get back to the um, teleportation device and start the cycle all over again. Yeah, this almost feels like the Riddler Mm -hmm. um, or or Two-Face, you know, having to say, I've got to give this out to play fair. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, Uh, uh, But yeah, so this is, well, this wasn't this to play fair. This is just to, to make that torturer keep going and going and going and going. Well, but then I think then you would have just not had to do that at all. I mean, why give them that clue unless you want to give them an out? The, the, the fact that you you're killing the doctor billions of times, right? That's the torture. So he, I mean, there's a part, I mean, there's times where he's in, in despair over this. And right, he's, like he's sitting there at that dining table, and uh, you know, just realizing that, well, maybe I'm trapped in hell, yeah, for eternity. Like this is going to be this for the for eternity. Yeah, so I I think it it's neither fish nor fowl, in my opinion, only yeah. Charles. Okay, it if if it's if it's a torture, yeah, then there would have been they wouldn't have made him work so hard to um stay alive in other words it would have been automatically when he died the game would have reset and he would have been in the teleportation tube right away if you just wanted to kill him over and over again unless you unless you wanted to give him hope and then take and then take that away so that's why i'm saying that's the clue was so that um Okay, so I can see you where, and there. Then you see the, you know, wall of amber mm-hmm. stopping you from getting there. And they just did not picture the doctor would figure out how to get through the amber. Possibly. Okay, I like it better when they they had this impossible way to escape. Mm-hmm. But in their mind, okay, at least it's not quote-unquote murder we've given him a chance and if he's clever enough and who knows maybe this is a test we're going to find out later exactly we don't know yet yeah because we do know that um gallifreyans can be some messed up people yes they right? can yes they can be and uh one particular time lord in you know comes to mind right off the bat yeah, we don't know. Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know a lot about classic uh, Who, mm-hmm. Charles, uh, but I do know they are some messed up people. Yes, they do. And uh, like I said, you know, there's there's one that you've seen pretty recently that should yeah. spring to mind. Absolutely, but you know, that's the crazy one. I'm just saying the normal <laughs> Alpha fan. You know, yeah, they're, not- yeah, they're they're basically jerks too. Absolutely. That's why I don't know why the doctor was in such a rush to find Gallifrey because they're basically jerks, and they yeah. always and they always kind of have been. But again, it's like, well, they're my people, so therefore I have to go look for them. Uh, the do you want to share a little bit on your theory about his psychic abilities and him being when he was young? Uh, do you think that was just a throwaway line? I I thought it was a funny bit with the door that if you're kind to the door because it's like no one ever pays attention to me thank you (laughs) 
the um, well, they've kind of hinted over the years that the Doctor has some form of telepathic abilities. I mean, they have these these telepathic circuits on the TARDIS, so that the Doctor can kind of visualize where he wants to go. But um, but they made like reference to like uh, like Susan, the Doctor's granddaughter Susan. She mentioned that she was kind of telepathic early on. Um, during the, the, you know, like those first 10 or so, um, Hartnell era stories. So, uh, it's not entirely, you know, inconsistent. Uh, plus we know that with, um, when the, the various multi-doctor, uh, stories where the doctor kind of telepathically links to his other selves when, you know, when they have, they go contact, and then, you know, there's that kind of blinking where they, they, they telepathically link up to share information between each other faster. Okay, I, so, I can see so that. So I'd say the Gallifreyans, uh, at least, you know, maybe or at least Time Lords, have uh, mm. at least limited telepathic abilities. Yeah. Um, I think the episode was very good at showing how clever... The doctor is. Yes. Um, you know, doing the counting, and that way he knew how long he could rest and sleep, and then coming up with the plan. Yeah, because he talks yeah. about like one, like he's on one side of the castle, and he calculates, well, if I start at this end and run all the way to the under, and I've got this much time away yeah. fr- away from the veil to think. Yeah. Yeah. So that was interesting. Do you? Um, did you understand when he started crashing, you know, hitting the wall, what he was trying to do? The, the moment I kind of knew, figure, I figured the moment I figured out what he was planning, okay. um, yeah. when he keeps he, they showed him hitting that wall over and over. Like when they mm-hmm. started to montage and have him yeah. cycle through that stuff for, and they were focusing on the hitting. Yes. Um, and I'm thinking he's going to chip away at that every little bit by bit by bit until yeah. it finally breaks through. That's when I figured it out. Um, yeah, I kind of <laughs> thought the same thing. And then they were hitting at the bird metaphor and then he, right. he made some comment, which clicked, confirmed it for me about talking about the bird, you know, um, you know, breaking down an entire mountain with its beak. And yeah. And that's like, it's like, oh, that's what he's doing. He's chipping through that wall. Right. It's, and um, it's all him going through the motions over and over to break through that wall. And um, now, granted, why he didn't take the spade and start whacking at it, it might have been a little easier <laughs> if he had just taken the spade against that wall. Instead of your hand. Yes, that's, that. That actually, I had not thought of that, but now that you bring that up, yeah, it, yes, that would have made that, that um, might have shaved it, you know, like a good hundred thousand years off your, off yeah, your maybe. There. I don't know. Um, yeah, it was very interesting that closed loop mm-hmm. and them doing that. Um, I, did um. He talked about the veil was a, a memory from childhood, right? That he was afraid. Right. And, and that is part of the reason why I thought he may have been a little bit afraid. You know, and they, when... You know, yeah, they did make... I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but they did say... No, no, that, please. Um, the doctor did make a comment that he's in a world of things constructed from his nightmares. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, this this trap was essentially the doctor's fears. That's why he would be afraid. And we have established earlier mm-hmm. in other episodes, right, that um, he's he ran away mm-hmm. from Gallifrey and has been running since. Right. Now, they did make a comment. You know, they, they kind of... Moffat, of course, has to explain everything. Yes. So um, he goes back... And to this one comment the second doctor made in the war games, mm-hmm. where that he left Gallifrey because he was bored. 
Right. So he makes a comment here. He, the, as he's being confronted by the the veil, he he hurry yeah. like he panically or in a panicky state. He says, "No, no, no! I, like I was lying about being bored. I left because I was afraid." Yeah. Or something to that effect. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and then. Um, so we don't know we, why he was afraid. Yeah. But, you know, and then we. We get all the way back to uh, when Martha was the doctor's companion, and he talked about the uh, he and the master had to look into this schism, mm-hmm. the, right? unten- the untempered schism. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you sta- you stand there, eight years old, staring at the raw power of time and space. Some would be inspired, some would run away, and some would go mad. And obviously the and, master went mad, and the doctor ran away. Yeah, and Martha says, which one was he? He says, oh, I'm the one that ran away. I never stopped. So I thought that was nice. Um, I was very mad at myself, not only because I did not recognize the city based on the previous scenes we've seen it, even yeah. you know, in the – Day of the Doctor and exactly. you know, some of the anniversary. Yeah, but because um, it's yeah, it's all over Day of the Doctor yeah. too. So yeah, but when he tells the kid, um, you know, he references the long way round. Yes, and that was an iconic line mm-hmm. when he was talking about going home and finding that. Right. Um, so I thought that was a really nice line. So essentially, he followed through on his promise. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. And it appears we, unless they do a bait and switch, we, the next episode will be after 11 years of New Who? 11? 12? Well, How many? Uh, well, I mean, we've had 10 years of New Who. Okay, yeah. So uh, we are going back to the home planet. Yeah, Gallifrey. We are on yeah, well, it. Mean, yeah, Superman is returning to Krypton. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and um, unless it's a bait and switch. Right, but I don't think it is. I because, don't think so either. Because for one thing, we've got one of the actors that was in Day of the Doctor. Yes. He, he's this guy, uh, Ken Bones, I believe the actor's name is. He's playing a character called the General, who was mm-hmm. in Day of the Doctor during that whole war room sequence. Yes. And uh, he's going to be in... Uh, next week's episode, mm-hmm. Hellbent. Yeah. In addition to um, the guy who played uh, Master Lewin on um, Game of Thrones yeah. as the as the new Lord President. Yes. Um, so we're going to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me your theory on this hybrid thing. Okay. Please. Um, okay. And if you don't have a theory, it's okay. Well, the uh, the the very last thing the doctor says in this episode, uh, he says that the um, that the uh, the doctor says the hybrid destined to conquer Gallifrey and stand in its ruins is me. So the question before the panel is: Is he saying me as in himself? Yeah. Or me, capital me, M, me, yes. being, being a shilder. And especially okay. since a shilder, we know from the trailers, is going to be in Hellbent. Okay. So, again, this also leads to another question. Was a shilder the one who created this trap for the doctor? So I don't think so because I th- now I think she sold him off and mm-hmm. we saw that. Right. Um, I don't think so either. I, I don't understand. And um, we may be seeing the um, we may be seeing the scenes in the barn, mm-hmm. right? And the right. thing from yeah, we saw that in a couple of th- right thoughts right. and um. And we also get the return of Ohila from the Sisterhood of Cor- of Karn yes. from right. the Night of the Doctor and also earlier in the season. Yeah. So, so you could make the argument that the hybrids 
I mean, the doctor has already destroyed this. You know, that's been a common thing. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you know. Fear me, I've killed a Time Lord. You know, or you know, I've killed Time Lords. Will feel me more because I've killed them all. Right from the doctor's um, wife. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think I think the me he's referring to is a shielder. Okay. I think a shielder is the hybrid, being half Viking human and mm-hmm. half Meyer. Okay. Because he said from two warrior races. There we and, go. And he Good said thing. that, and, you know, and, you know, the Vikings were warriors. The Meyer were warriors. Mm-hmm. So it kind of fits. And, you know, um, I, I did like the idea that he said, you know, of course it's not the Daleks. Daleks would never allow that. I thought that was pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. interesting. Even though in uh, the, uh, was it the evolution of the Daleks or whatever, Daleks in yeah. Manhattan, they had those like they tried to do a hybrid with Daleks and humans. Yes. Where they have like the little tentacles on their head that kind of look like dildos, but <laughs> Yeah. That was pretty funny. Very good. Um what else might we need to cover? Um, let's see. Well we talked about or yeah, we talked about the long way around. Um okay, so if it's not a shoulder. Who created this trap? Who, yes. do you, who do you think created the trap? I have my theory. Let's see if it matches yours. Well, this is an elaborate, um, convoluted, mm-hmm. but um, you know, it almost feels like there. This is a test um, for that someone has them doing them. I don't think it's Missy. Um, I think it's some kind of Time Lord thing. I think it's the, you know, the council in Gallifrey mm-hmm. has set this up somehow. Though I can't figure out why and what they're trying to prove. But, you know, that's how it appears their advanced technology would be the one to do this. My problem with the Shirda is, you know, I don't know if she could do all this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, as far as we know, she has not gone to space, though she certainly has the ability now that she's got this, you know, uh, asylum area there in London. Of aliens, uh, right. Yeah, that would be my guess, is that this is something that it's almost a quest. Um, because they had not planned on Clara dying. Mm-hmm. This was, you know, this was, that was Clara's own fault, which we got a nice shout out to in the episode you know, what would you do? You know, I'd be like you. And yeah, well, to be fair, that's what killed you. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, see, I, th- I do think it's Missy. Okay. And I'll tell you why. All right. Um, I think Missy has been working or at least, you know, she's using a shielder. Okay. I think Missy was the one that arranged for a shielder to get there so that they, she, she can get that teleport bracelet on the doctor to get him teleported into that confession dial okay. as, a, as a means of torture. Because uh, this is, ex- again, this is something pretty convoluted, which is right up the master's alley to yes. come up with something ridiculously convoluted. Okay. And essentially, this is Time Lord technology using the confession okay. dial. And if you remember, Early in the season, um, Missy gets the confession dial from Clara. Good point. So mm-hmm. why would she? Why was she so insistent on getting that confession dial? Because she so, wanted to set up the so the, the trap. trap. Yeah. Okay, I'll buy it. I, I think <laughs> that works out. Yeah, I think that the confession dial is what did it to me. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. Yeah, I think good call, Charles. Thank you. And then, okay. of course, being a confession now, it's obviously bigger on the inside, which is yes. how the doctor could exist in that, you know, within that confession dial. That's Time mm-hmm. Lord. That's Time Lord technology right there. Yeah. So, um, so presumably, if the Time Lords are, you know, tucked away in their little pocket universe. Now, the, yeah. the, 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 there is the question, though, OK. How does the doctor getting out of uh, the confession dial lead him to Gallifrey? Or why? Yes. Why does it do that? We don't. And, we don't know yet. And what time 
zone of what ta- era of Gallifrey right. is it at, you know? Yeah, so we don't so. know if it's like um, the, uh, you know, the, like, again, we have that general there from the war room. Right. So we don't know if it's during the time war, before the time war. Yeah. Or what have you. My guess so, is during the time war. Could be, because, I mean, they do make a point of that barn being there. Yes, so that's my guess. Yep. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think it's Missy, and I think it's this is that okay. confession dial going all the way back. All right, good. Anything <laughs> else we need to cover? Well, uh, let's see. As no. he checks his notes. Yeah, I don't think, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay, good. Um, uh, quotes. You first. Okay. Um, let's see. If you think because she is dead, I. if you think because she is dead, I am weak, then you understand very little. If you were any part of killing her and you're not afraid, then you no, understand nothing at all. So for your own sake, understand this. I am the doctor. I'm coming to find you, and I will never, ever stop. I, I did love that. Um uh, yeah, uh, some good stuff. I mean, you talked about this mm-hmm. um, both online, you know, and, and you've discussed this already that, you know, this was a kind of showcase for Peter Capaldi's doctor. Um, I love this just because of the practical um, implications. Um, you know, assume you're going to survive. Always assume that. Imagine you've already survived. There's a storm room in your mind. Lock the door and think, this is my storeroom. I always imagine I'm back in my TARDIS, showing off, telling you how I escaped, making you laugh. And and I think survive can be pushed with win. Mm-hmm. I think, and, and I think this is a lot of different sayings of, you know, no retreat, no surrender, you know, to bring yep. in Bruce. Um, or so, never, you know, never give yeah. up, never surrender to bring in Gal- yeah. Galaxy Quest. Yeah, so I, I just like that line a lot. Yep. Do you have others, a couple others you want uh, to share? Yeah, well, that was one of them. But, yeah. uh, but the other one I have is, it's a killer puzzle box designed to scare me to death, and I'm trapped inside it. Must be Christmas. Yes. Uh, any others? That's it. That's all I got. All right. The the other one I thought was funny is I think this whole place is inside a closed energy loop, mm-hmm. constantly recycling, or maybe I'm in hell. That's okay. I'm not scared of hell. It's just heaven for bad people. Exactly. <laughs> and I thought that was really, really yeah. kind of funny. That was a good line. I like yes. that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Charles, yeah. how would you rate this episode? Uh, apparently higher than you. Yes. I give this one... 9.5 out of 10 Dr. Skulls falling into the sea. Mm. I really adore this episode. The only, the only thing that really kind of detracts for me is that um, the, the little bootstrap paradox thing. And then also the fact that we don't really, I mean, we kind of get Clara, but we don't, um, we don't really have a companion for the doctor apart from us. We're the companion. But yeah. but it so it's in my mind it's not a true Doctor Who adventure as long as you you have just the Doctor which was fine with me yeah um, um so I am going to give it a tentative seven point five mm-hmm. um, clothes drying in front of the fireplace okay but I'm going to put an asterisk this... because if next week we get a payoff mm-hmm. and the three together tell this epic tale right you know if there's a setup but for now and and you may you may revise your grade i may revise my grade and there is a discussion among um tv critics and you know maureen ryan and ryan mcgee Mm -hmm. talking tv with the ryan and ryan always talk about that you know in this world of binge watching yes when netflix or amazon drops a whole season at one time should you think of each episode as an individual episode or should it, it's a chapter in a novel. 
And they believe that they should be individual episodes because that's what TV is. Right. And each episode has to be judged on its own. Um, but I tend to, you know, I go along the ride for like Game of Thrones. Right. So that's why I guess I'm kind of being mealy mouth is if we get a good enough payback, I'll go, OK, you know, the, they earned that payoff by setting things up. I'll come back and raise it. So, but I'm glad you loved it. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, I think the structure is different, um, in the sense that uh, dropping a whole season on Netflix, it kind of reminds me of like getting a trade paperback of yes. co- of comics, where you get, um, you know, like six or seven comic books all in a row, as right. opposed to having to wait month after month after right. month to find out how the story ends. Yes. So, um, sometimes the fun is in the waiting. Especially if you got good cliffhangers, because yeah, and, because you can you can speculate and you're like, ooh, what if this happens? What if this happens? Sometimes yes. you get a little let down because your imagination comes up with something a little better than what the writer did. But yeah, but mm-hmm. sometimes you also don't expect what the writer might do, right? And then you're constantly surprised. You're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Well, you know, to go back to when the. Uh, when Moore's Battlestar Galactica was <laughs> on, you know, um, the speculation of who are the, you know, five Cylons, right? Right. And, you know, well, if you're binge watching it, oh, I know yeah, two exactly. episodes later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Like, I'm gonna, I'll am i just uh, skip ahead and we're like, oh, okay, yeah. that's what happened. So it's kind okay. of a cheat almost to yeah. binge watch. Well, you just don't have the same it, – it's a different – story experience exactly uh and um it's kind of like if you start uh watching babylon 5 um with the tv movie that kind of explains you know um sinclair's hole in his mind and what happens on that war is it then watch the first season it's a different experience than if you watch the first season and you don't know what's going on so I, i agree because that's how i got into babylon 5 yeah, because we watched that TV movie on TNT. Yeah, the the little um, in the beginning. Uh, the or begin- yeah, in the beginning. Thank yeah. you. And uh, we watched that. Then we started watching season one. Right. And I think it it helped because yeah, it, having because having watched season one, um, it's very dry at the beginning. Yeah, it doesn't really and, get going until season two. Right. And in fact, J. Michael Stravinsky, when people have asked, he said. I recommend you watching in the beginning and then watching it because you can enjoy the first season. You know what the characters don't know. Right. And, and that is a different way of looking. Um, and, and it truly is tomato, tomato. It, I think you need to use both types of storytelling depending on it. And so we'll see what happens. Yep. Uh, Charles, yes. reverse the polarity for us. Reverse the polarity. This one was a tricky one. Okay. Um, for because which there should, aren't too many because there, there were, aren't too many anti Doctor Light episodes. Well, because this is Doctor yeah, Full, uh, Full yeah, Full. basically yeah. This isn't yeah because you know there's there's episodes like Midnight, which have you know like the Doctor pretty much by himself, but Donna's in it. Yes. At the end of the beginning. Well, and there's also other characters. Yeah, exactly. And there's other right. characters. Yeah. So, um, so this uh, we've never had a an a story where the doctor is by himself with no other characters around him. Um, technically the veil is a character, but you know, he's, he's not yeah. exactly chatting away with him. Fair enough. So yes. Really count. So, um, and going back to this, I decided to go back to the deadly assassin. Okay. Uh, from 1976, this is season 14 of the original series. All right. Uh, this third story from season 14 written by Robert Holmes. Okay. And uh, so after saying goodbye to Sarah Jane in the previous story, so already right there, you've got a little bit of a comparison because yes. this episode, the doctor said goodbye to Clara. Um, the fourth doctor arrives on Gallifrey. Ooh, okay. And that picked your interest right up. Uh, yes. After receiving a mysterious summons from the Time Lords and having a precognitive vision of the Lord President being assassinated. Ooh, okay. So after noticing a sniper rifle on a catwalk above the Panopticon, the Doctor investigates, but 
Of course, the president gets assassinated as he's doing so, and the doctor ends up getting framed for it. Of Naturally. Okay. Of course. Um, this ultimately leads to a confrontation with the master. Ah, okay. Who, is, who at this point is almost completely emaciated at the end of his final incarnation. And his whole plan is to steal energy from the Eye of Harmony to gain a new cycle of regenerations. Unfortunately, if he gets away with it and is successful, uh, Gallifrey gets destroyed along with a hundred other worlds as a result of a chain reaction. Okay. Sounds it's interesting. A, it's a good story. It's a great oh, story. Oh, it sounds like a great story. But, but basically, you have the, the fourth Doctor, no yeah. companion, on, facing off against the Master on Gallifrey. Doesn't okay. get any better than that. Absolutely. Good deal. Um, Charles, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at Charles Skaggs on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, also on Facebook, of course. Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus. And uh, my blog of geeky things, Damn Good Coffee and Hot, where I talk about a lot of things like Doctor Who, Next Stop Everywhere. And then there's also my little podcast, the Fandom Zone podcast that I do with a uh, friend of the show, Karen Lindsay. And uh, where we talk about all kinds of comic books on TV, including Jessica Jones, to kind of bring the conversation full circle. Absolutely. Um, we, uh, You guys are going to get a little bit um, break, um, at, yeah. you know, for the next couple of weeks. Well, uh, this yeah. week, well, only this week. We get four yeah. episodes that we're going to be recording probably on Monday, uh, tomorrow, yeah. um, including the first episode of Jessica Jones. Very nice. So uh, then we go back to like seven or eight the okay. following week as everything comes back. So okay, um, including that, I... including that big Flash Arrow crossover. Ooh, looking forward to that. Yes, I am at Jesse Jackson DFW. Uh, I am also on Facebook, uh, and you can hear me on also known AKA Jessica Jones. Uh, we are uh, Zach and I are going through two episodes at a time, uh, watching it. Um, You're going so, through those quick. Uh, yeah, um, instead of just binge watching it, so enjoying that. Uh, and uh, set listing Bruce is continuing to be rolling along, and so you can check that out. And uh, we'll we've got a couple plans. We're going to finish up the season. Then we've got a couple of special episodes we're going to do, uh, and then we'll do the Christmas special, and then we will talk about what we're going to do in January, correct? Sounds like a plan. All right. So Sounds so good. before we sign off, so what do you think of former Dr. David Tennant on Jessica Jones as the Purple Man, um, a.k.a. Kilgrave? So, so, so I tend to... To make it come, Doctor Who related. Yeah, to, to, I tend to come things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I am always happy to see people, actors or actresses, getting roles um, because I just hate the idea of, you know, typecasting and, you know, they can't get a job. Right. Now, I realize you should not worry about that with David Tennant. I don't David think so. He's doing okay. He does Shakespeare. No. Yeah, he does all yeah, that. yeah, you know, he had two seasons of Broadchurch on, uh, you know, exactly. British and then, you know, he's Fox doing one, fine. He's doing fine. But that's my first thought is, you know, I'm always glad. Um, I think the character, you know, and there's a whole thing out there that people are really unhappy that he's playing such an unlikable character. Oh no, he's really good at playing a villain. Yeah. Um, oh no. You know, I, I, I think it's a horrible villain, and I think that's part of the beauty. Is Tenet is so charming, and is so likable. I think that pays to his strength. So I've only seen the two episodes, mm -hmm. but I did get to see, um, you know, where he goes to this penthouse. Right. And I, you know, no spoilers, but that Charles was, um, chilling. Oh, he, it, I mean, that's his, I mean, that's in its own way, more chilling than a ocean filled with Dr. Skull <laughs> and, you know, the, that veil was creepy, I admit. Yeah. that was creepy, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seven episodes in. Okay. So let me just say that, uh, 
all you all you tenant worshippers out there, uh, getting your hearts crushed uh, yeah. by by David Tennant actually being a a bad bad man. Uh, prepare to get them crushed even more because yeah. he's quite the sick bastard in this, and, yeah, and and he and he's totally seems to be totally enjoying himself doing so, just kind of trampling all over like the goody two shoes, mm. uh, being the doctor. Yeah, and uh, I am not a huge Kristen Ritter fan one way or another, though I think she's amazing in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I she's fantastic. Am, in this. I am a big Mike Coulter fan. Yeah. Because his role on The Good Wife, and he is just amazing as Luke Cage. Yeah, he's great. Um, you know, Carrie Ann Moss is wonderful. Um, you know, so there is, um, you know, Rachel Taylor as Trish Walker. I mean, so there's some great people there. Um, and so far, the story, I've seen, you know, <laughs> we fans have to judge things, right? You know, I've seen plenty of people, oh, it's good, but it's not as good as Daredevil. Or, oh, this puts Daredevil to shame. And I'm going, two totally different stories. (laughs) It's okay to like both. It's okay to like both. And, you know... Well, give me other people that compare Jessica Jones to Supergirl. Yeah. That's like, they're totally different, you know, stories. They're totally different stories. They don't have to be the same thing. Just back up. No. But uh, to to get things back to David Tennant before we sign off... Um, how great is it that he's actually using his doctor voice as Kilgrave? Yes, because he, he's not speaking with his normal Scots accent. Right. Um, yeah, it's, he's it's, he's using the doctor voice, which I think is just hilarious. I'm just picturing the doctor just being this completely evil, and it's just hilarious <laughs> to me. Absolutely, uh, David Tennant as the master. Oh, hey, there so, we go. Hey, there's another. very nice. All right. Um, for now, we're going to sign off. Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, it was uh, a lot of fun as always. And we're going to say keep hope alive and say to the rational mind, nothing is inexplainable, only unexplained, which goes through this episode. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.